five, six years. Um, all of them are famous problems related to software security, but all of them, regardless how um, big or how problematic the problem was, all these bugs were completely innocent. The developers did it not maliciously. Um, they didn't intend to do it. When the problem was discovered, they tried really hard to fix it. Uh, and that's one of the things which is completely different from our aspect of supply chain. Because at least with the way we look at supply chain, we look at people who, do, who try to do malicious stuff. They try to uh, uh, hurt you in purpose and not exploit uh, non-malicious uh, issues. If we're talking about software security and we're still not in supply chain, um, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. That's a known phrase. And if we're looking at the trend of CVEs, um, we see uh, an, a big increase, uh, both because we have more software, both because we have um, more bug bounties and more researchers trying to find issues. Um, and I guess that some of it are not very interesting issues or issues with very uh, unpopular software. But of course, some of it is very important, uh, very big issues, and we can't ignore it. And you can see both the trend in graphs and numbers. Uh, both of these statistics were taken uh, in the last uh, few days. Now when we're talking about uh, new avenues of software or infrastructure, uh, we're going to talk about something as code, uh, and we have plenty of it. Uh, it could be infrastructure as code, policies code, uh, and a lot of other stuff we'll see in, in next. And that made me think what happens to those who don't learn from the present. We're not talking about the past, but just recent present. Um, and I want to review a few, a few of the things we've seen just in, in that in recent August. So everything I'm going to show in the next few slides is from the past month, month and a bit. Um, we saw the, I'm going backwards. Uh, we saw the, the first phishing attack against PyPy users trying to steal accounts. Um, and then they can, of course, upload packages. They, of course, target um, popular packages. But these are actions people do uh, intentionally. They try to steal stuff. It's not uh, innocent mistakes anymore. And when they succeed, and if they succeed, the things they're going to upload are not going to be innocent uh, problems uh, with the packages. Uh, we, saw, we saw a threat actor publishes more than 1,000 malicious PyPy and NPM packages. Um, they took either existing packages and duplicated them or tried to add something on top or tried to do as little change as possible to fake the, the original package. Uh, but now you have a lot of others. And 1,000 might be uh, uh, a drop at the sea for both PyPy and, uh, and NPM. But if they have a mechanism that does this automatically, they can, and if they succeed and, and wouldn't be caught, then they can increase the numbers until they succeed. And that's quite different from the methods of someone trying to do one package manually. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. It doesn't have a lot of resources. With these numbers, at some point, they'll succeed. Okay, That is just statistics. Um, we saw uh, another user try to strike with uh, typo squatting, star jacking, and uh, especially tailored packages with malware. And both star jacking is trying to get credits from another project uh, and faking the reputation uh, of others. And then when you check the package, you think, oh, it has uh, 1,000 stars, 2,000 stars, 5,000 stars. I think it looks OK. It it's, it's looks uh, like a good choice, but it's completely malicious. Um, type of squatting, you choose a different name or something which is relatively similar to the or, uh, origin. And then people might get confused. Um, for example, something popular, add IO to the end, to the beginning, something in between, uh, .io or whatever. Uh, some packages you just add pi at the end if it's on Python related or something else. Um, another famous example, although it's completely not malicious, uh, can be Angular and Angular JS. Uh, both of them actually exist. And it's confusing for a lot of people. Uh, Google at some point switched from one to, to the other. 
Um, in another type of squatting campaign that's uh, early on, sorry, in mid-August, uh, targeting Python's top packages. Um, again, trying to get malware into these packages or something which is a copycat of them. Uh, with such a similar name, it might be actually confusing. And the last one we're going to, to go over, and uh, that's from uh, the begin beginning of August, is another campaign to create fake GitHub projects. All of them are clones of existing projects, uh, added one or two commits with malware, trying to hit them. Uh, in that case, it wasn't uploaded to, to other places, but it caught the attention because we monitor GitHub as well. Um, all of these few items uh, are stuff which our uh, software supply chain team both tracks, caches, and reports to others. Uh, we intentionally report on all of these actions, uh, both for the community to know, for other security company to know, and of course that's been reported to the relevant entity, uh, GitHub, NPM, PyPy, uh, whatever registry which is relevant, uh, trying to help them make their, the code they host more secure, or at least eliminate the bad actors from these uh, repositories. And it's a daily and continuous work each day, or in, actually also each night, the team gets new reports, new problems, new things they are marked as suspicious and need to be checked. Uh, and we see a lot of completely weird stuff and the sophistication level of the attackers get more and more, uh, gets higher. Going back to something as code, uh, we talked to about uh, infrastructure, Docker files, Helm charts, uh, uh, AWS cloud formation and the parallels from other vendors and so on. We see policy, configuration, and actually there's a trend that says everything is code, okay? Uh, even your, um, anything you, you might program or might do manually, you might find a way to automate it, build a framework for it, and do it on a more uh, automatic way. And that's, in a lot of cases, actually good. But uh, from my perspective, there's a disadvantage, because along the, all the benefits it brings, both the efficiency the, the ability to reuse and to repeat the same things. You want to deploy the same exact and same environment in a few places, use the exact same configuration on a few, uh, in, um, both deployments, environments, uh, projects, whatever. It makes uh, uh, everything much more easier. And of course, if it's code and it's usually easier to maintain, uh, and then we enjoy the benefits of uh, software development lifecycle, GitOps, Git in, in general, and so on. Uh, and anything you benefit from uh, saving it as text and something you can uh, easily change. But we also get dependencies or uh, famous from other places, dependencies hell, um, and also supply chain problems. As, and some of them we just saw uh, with software mostly around uh, Python scripts and uh, JavaScript, but it's true for the whole ecosystem. Uh, Go has its own problems because of direct dependencies or no repository which uh, fix it, fixates uh, the packages and versions. You download everything as source. Uh, Ruby has its own problems, Java of course. So these, are two, these two are just the biggest examples, but it's not unique to any of these languages. And it's not the fault of the languages or the developers. Uh, it's, it's something important to say. If we're talking about the efficiency of some infrastructure as code, uh, we're talking about the from uh, of Docker files, which are you based on other, on other Docker images uh, and other Docker files. Uh, include, by the way, wasn't accepted. Uh, I checked and I saw that there, it was requested a few times, but it wasn't allowed. Uh, Terraform has its template. Kubernetes has, has the Helm charts. CloudFormation actually does have an, an include option for that and many more. Uh, and this is great efficiency to have, and it's important for us to, to use it. Uh, but then, again, we're uh, starting to use uh, sources not written by us, or by peers in our company, or in the organization we trust. And trust is an important thing. We start to get in uh, files and sources uh, and templates from the, the the wild, the internet, uh, and then we need to start to think, do we trust them, do we not? How do we check them? If we check them, and most people don't check them, how many of you just saw uh, um, instruction of how to install something? Yes, add this uh, um, 
Helm charts repository, edit, just uh, do install, and that's it. You never check the, the details, you didn't read all of the files. Uh, probably, this, my guess is very little of you did it. Uh, same way, a lot of people who install NPM packages or other packages don't check the pre-install scripts, the post-install scripts, uh, which is, by the way, another attack vector done on, on these packages. Uh, you might get a completely um, non-malicious package except the pre-install line which brings something new to your system or try to mess with the dependencies and then it's different from what is being declared. Um, if we're talking about supply chain and containers uh, specifically, uh, first, in a lot of cases, there's a challenge to finding the right container, um, which is the process, in a lot of cases, similar to finding the right NPM, PyPy package uh, by others. Of course, most of you use base images or uh, whatever for, especially uh, the distribution itself, sometimes for something higher in the application stack. Uh, would it be the, um, the programming language, the application server like Node.js or, or something else, Java, uh, and so on. And then you try to do only your bit on top of this container, trying to find, to find the largest base container you can, so your portion would be the smallest, which makes a lot of sense from a maintenance perspective. I want to do only my part. I'm trusting others to do their part uh, and using the benefiting from the ecosystem, which is, of course, great. Don't understand me wrong. But when you try to find it, that's a process which has some risk in it. And when you find something, how much would you trust it? So we'll do it together. Um, I want to, for example, to use uh, Minayo. It's a project I use quite extensively in the last uh, uh, year and a half. And it's a popular project. I'm going to GitHub. It has uh, 35,000 stars. It's, it's quite popular. There's a startup that supports it. Everything here. Looks perfect. Now I want to find uh, um, a container or a Helm chart to install it. First, okay, I'll go to uh, Artifact Hub, I'll search Min.io, and already I have a few results. And here the confusion starts, because some of it might be official, some of it might not be official. I have no idea who to trust and who's not. Um, and even if we're trying to, to see uh, who's the uh, official channel, there might be difference between what we want and what they supply. Uh, for example, we have uh, something that says Minayo official. Uh, it has two stars. It was updated uh, 10 days ago. Uh, and the image uh, has D security rating. I have no idea if it's actually official. Uh, it's updated relatively recently, but uh, I'm not sure. Uh, the version doesn't say a lot to me by the way, um, and notice there's both version and up version, which is confusing. Um, if we check in something else, we see uh, another Min.io, uh, the repo is uh, Bitnami. Uh, both the up version and the version are completely different, so I have no idea what I'm getting here and there. Um, it has more stars, it's a ver verified publishers, but the images have lower rating, security rating, and I'm still not talking about What's behind this security rating? So what would I check? Um, I have another one which says, uh, uh, sorry, this was updated a day ago. OK, maybe it's better, maybe it's worse. I have another one with the logo of Minayo. Um, the repo is Minayo again. What's the difference between Minayo and Minayo official? Uh, updated two years ago. Very nice. Um, version, it's not clear. Version 8 and version 4. Version 4 is from 10 days ago. Version 8 is from two years ago. It starts to be a little bit confusing. And the clarity here is not always um, easy to understand. And this is relatively a very simple example. Um, by the way, if you look at this, this is something else, still the official logo. Uh, nine hours ago from a verified publisher, I have no idea whose uh, true chart is it and how true is it. Um, no idea, OK? And then I might go to try to find something or what's the source uh, the project refers to. Would it be OK for me? What's the difference between what Bitnami brings? And I don't know. It's, it's a verified publisher. It might be better, uh, and so on. Um, 
all of these issues are part of something, um, I, I look at it as levels of typo squatting. Um, we have a logo for that uh, because we reported quite a lot on different uh, um, areas. But in this case, we have problem both with the Helm chart uh, name and uh, other infrastructure as code. It's, it's the same problem. Uh, we might have problem with the container name, which is the next phase. And of course, later on when you have a specific container, we might talk about the status of the software packages in it. Uh, it are they updated, not updated? Do they have CVs? Uh, and so on. And again, uh, we have the same problem with trying to find the right uh, container. We just, we just uh, looked for the right uh, helm charts. And again, uh, I'm going to look at this time at uh, Docker Hub. I'm sorry to remove the, the header. And again, I see Bitnami, verified publisher, updated a day ago, looks great. Uh, 10 million downloads and 50 stars. I'm not sure the ratio makes sense, but 10 million downloads, okay, I think it's, it's good enough. Again, uh, Docker Hub, verified publisher, interesting. Um, I see another verified publisher, Rancher, Minayo, Minayo, updated two years ago, doesn't make sense. Uh, IBM Com, it's a big company, Minayo, updated three years ago, but it's a verified publisher. What does it bring me differently than uh, uh, Bitnami? The number of downloads uh, starts to go lower and lower, 10 million, 1 million, uh, 10K. This one is the, the client, so we'll drop it for a second. I have no idea, that's the, that, that's the, the first page. If we continue, actually the official images is Minayo Minayo. It has no specific logo. It was updated, uh, depends on, on, the, on the image if you're looking for the client or the server. And this one has 500 million downloads. But that's not the top result, okay? Bitnami is the top result because it's a verified publisher. And that's a point we might get confused. What's the, what does the status of verify publisher means when we need to select something? And what's the process of becoming that? Um, and in how many cases these verified publishers are not the official release? And I'm not talking about the content yet, okay? Uh, I'm talking about where the uh, origin source and which is the open source project which produces uh, these images. And this uh, gets in more and more confused. And we're talking about project with 35,000 stars on GitHub. It's quite popular, it's a big infrastructure. If we take more esoteric examples, the results are going to be more weirder and weirder and harder to uh, find out uh, what's going on there. We'll look at uh, another example, and remember we still haven't talked about the con contents of the container. Uh, we'll talk about uh, container supply chain. Um, there's a, recently I, I saw a blog post I'll uh, reference uh, in, a, in a few slides about the content of the uh, WordPress, uh, con official WordPress container that's actually uh, published on Docker Hub. They don't have an organization uh, because it's official, so it's just WordPress, okay, comparing to uh, something else. And uh, uh, you see that Docker, the, sorry, the WordPress Docker file has from uh, PHP, something, some variant of PHP, both the versions and uh, the web server. That Docker file has, uh, which is, is based on uh, Debian, uh, Buster, which is one of the flavors of Debian, uh, and Dash Slim. So we, we know that we have containers, we have different layers. You can see the, these different layers. I'm not going into the, the content of each of them. But just to have in mind that with, whenever you install WordPress from the official container, uh, you actually get the, uh, the, the official container of the PHP project, and then something uh, from the Debian distribution that's actually official in this case as well. Uh, if you want to look at the containers, sorry, the Docker files themselves, you're more than welcome. That's a little bit of reverse engineering to understand what we're having. Uh, because that's the easiest, easiest way. If you want to look at other ways or the metadata the container has, it starts to get a little bit more cryptic, so it's easier to look at the Dockerfy itself if it's available. Uh, if we look at the uh, Debian container, 
it actually has from scratch and you have a root file system, that's it. So in, the, in this case, we have no idea what's going on in there um, and how can we trust it when people just say, okay, take my tarball, use it on your, as your system. Um, can we trust it? Can, can we not trust it? Um, and so on. And if you look at where the, the, the files are at, you see the addresses start to be a little bit weird, okay? It's not github.com slash Debian, okay? And it might make sense, Docker Debian artifacts, okay? Um, but I think it's, it's I don't know, it, it, and, and I'm a Debian developer and that started to look a little bit weird for me. So I kept digging and I end up in a, a web page uh, that says, uh, Debian Docker images checksums, and you have uh, the complete numbers and all the checksums. Uh, it's available. It's actually available on a Debian uh, uh, domain. Um, Debian has both .org and .net. Um, so if you want to verify at least Debian, you have some way to do it, which at least uh, lower the, uh, my level of suspicion. But again. I didn't check the, the, the numbers themselves. And I would expect people, and especially on mission critical systems and production, to find a way to do it. But I guess almost no one does it. Um, and the question is, if something gets changed, would we know it? And in this case, the question is, after you've seen all that, um, do you feel safe? Exactly. The, the, it, it's, it's, Probably, I guess, most of you start, okay, I'm feeling a little bit weird. And that weird feeling is good because that would hopefully make you at some point start to check your environment. And I want to give you a different question in that sense that who said that the Docker images, sorry, the Docker files I showed you are the actual Docker files used to create those containers. We have no idea. We can guess, we can think they're relatively similar, but we're not sure. There's no way to do it to, to make sure uh, um, in a one-to-one -one relationship uh, and to verify that, and that's something not done. When you upload an image to Docker Hub, you're not uh, required to upload the uh, sources of the container. Uh, both the Docker file, you, you don't need to upload it. The, act, the other sources, uh, um, it's not a requirement. And I'm comparing that to the way, for example, a Linux distribution works, where you have all of the sources, all of the scripts available for reproduction. And that's a big difference. Uh, in a lot of cases, uh, and I've done it for the last 15, 15 years as part of Debian, uh, I build everything on my machine. I make sure it works. I, I, I verify the binary. And I can decide if I want to upload uh, all of the sources and one binary to the, to the servers, to the build servers, or just the sources, they build the whole platform for every architecture. In that case, Debian supports. It's the same for Reddit, uh, Canonical, and every distribution out there. Uh, they build all the artifacts, and we know it's coming from the same source. Uh, and again, uh, how would you know it, or how would you verify that is a, a, a critical task which is not something which has a definite answer. And that's something from my perspective of supply chain, which is very worrisome. You might say, okay, I'm safe because I can just scan the container, which is a good answer, but it's a wrong answer. Because, and this is an article uh, published uh, by Dan Lorneck, uh, he is actually part of the conference. Uh, he published it uh, two weeks ago. And his title is what your scanner and container scanner doesn't know, can't, sorry, can hurt you. Um, and what he's describing the, in his blog post is that the container scanners are dependent on what the uh, distribution uh, package manager or the uh, software uh, package manager like PyPy, NPM, and so on would report is installed in the container. And this is what it actually scans. And uh, I wouldn't repeat because Dan did uh, a nice job in, in the blog post and gave a few examples. I won't repeat it live. Uh, if you're interested, you can uh, look at the, at the link at the bottom. Um, 
And I checked a few other scanners uh, on top of one of what Dan checked. And some of them has extra rules for new cases or uh, new edge cases. Uh, for example, if you install Node not from the Node packages, uh, some of the container scanners might notice that. But it's one, one application server, very specific one. Um, I'm not sure if it's related to the location and so on. There are easy ways to hide it. Um, and if you're looking at these scanners uh, to report about content and then CVEs, it's relatively easy to fool them because they're taking the naive approach, which in a lot of cases is good or good enough. But if we're talking about supply chain, it's not good at all because we trust too much about what we have in the container and the version being reported. I can go to the registry inside the container, change the versions to something which doesn't have a CVE, and give you whatever binary I want because you'll have no idea because the scanner doesn't have any idea. And that leads me uh, to the importance of metadata we have in the container. So if container scanners mostly, and this is uh, uh, something worth uh, mentioning, uh, if they mostly verify the package, what package managers see, then that data should be important. Otherwise, we're going to see nothing or be blind. Um, we want to invest more in those custom uh, scan rules for popular special cases, uh, no JS as I mentioned. But remember that's an endless game of cat and mouse or guacamole or uh, whatever uh, you want to call it because people who want to attack will find a different way which is not part of your rules. If your scanner is open source, you have the disadvantage of they also know what you're doing, which is still okay, but it's part of the game. Um, and one of the results we want to do is result, uh, reuse existing artifacts instead of rebuilding them. And that's quite important because a lot of people decide to rebuild again and again or build from source. And that has its benefit because you control the build. But in a lot of cases, it has the disadvantage because you're now the one responsible for security. Upgrading the versions, applying patch if it's relevant because the patch might already be available, but it's not being released officially uh, or as an as official version uh, and so on. And here, in some cases, building from source instead of relying on uh, an official distribution, both the Linux one and the, the whole ecosystem, and also true for a few certain softwares, uh, sometimes like shooting yourself in the leg. You take a lot of responsibility on you uh, and probably on, on your organization. And now you need to uh, give the answers or be responsible for them. And going back to the WordPress example, uh, in that case, they use the official PHP uh, uh, images, which are built from source. They are not use the, the PHP packages built by Debian, and hence they don't get the treatment of the uh, both the Debian security team, the, the PHP team at Debian, which does a lot of work to make sure they have all the newest patches uh, taken uh, uh, even before the, the official release. Uh, and I know, that, I know that because I've done that in the past. And this is, this is also why I chose the example. I know how much hard we work to make, as part of Debian to make sure every security fix is available as soon as possible and not only as the regular release which might be once a month, once in two months, and so on. Depends on which project and what their release policy is. Um, sometimes you, we have security issues which are not critical enough to deem a new release, but as maintainers of that package, we want to include it because we have a lot of users and we feel responsible. And that's also something we did at the PHP team in Debian. Um, another benefit of reusing existing uh, artifacts, sorry, one direction, um, is that if we are based on a Linux distribution, it has its own mechanisms. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, uh, Debian, I looked at the rootfs container I showed you earlier, I actually opened the tar file uh, to check what's in it, and I saw uh, the, the files which are based for uh, the Debian packaging systems. And one of these files is actually MD5 sums of the binary, sorry, of all the files, including the binaries. And this means I can start verifying stuff because I'm based on an official Linux distribution. I have something to compare it to. 
So I know what's in my Debian containers, actually something I would get if I install Debian on a VM or a regular machine or whatever. It's easy to check. And especially the important part are both the libraries and binaries. Uh, if someone changed the man page, the documentation, I don't care. That's something I would be happy to actually remove from the container because it's, it's not relevant. Uh, but this ver verification is only possible if you're basing yourself on a regular Linux distribution and you didn't try to do something uh, in between to uh, reduce uh, the size or to remove the metadata. Uh, and in that case, welcome to Distribless Container. Um, this is a, a work by Google from 2017. Um, which takes some of the binaries from the distribution, but removes a lot of the data we can use to verify these images. Uh, the process, it's not so friendly, uh, to say at least, and it's easier to, to verify things, even if we wanted. And the benefit of size doesn't always mean we have a benefit in security. Uh, yes, it's nice to remove access packages, some stuff we don't need, documentation, uh, other uh, man pages, translation to other languages, that all makes sense. But if you don't give me a way to verify the binaries in the container, I would start to worry. Um, and that metadata is quite important. Yesterday I heard a talk by uh, Canonical to say how they, they created their own uh, quote-unquote distribution uh, containers, and they found a way to better chop the packages, uh, but they keep the metadata, so that's a much better way and lets us at least in, uh, verify stuff if we want to. Um, the reason I'm mentioning reproducibility is because uh, the, distrib the Linux distribution works hard to make sure their builds are reproducible. Uh, it's an effort being done in Debian for the last, I would say, 10, 12 years. Um, the credit for the team uh, is well deserved. And that makes sure whenever the binary is built, it has the same checksum, uh, no timestamp in it, uh, things which we can verify both over time, both over different architecture, and it's quite important. And that's something I think we should keep for containers, because otherwise we might lose the, the great benefits of this work, and that's important for uh, security. Um, from security perspective, we can enjoy uh, uh, um, how the ecosystem works, and in this case, and especially around security, CentOS double checks Reddit sources and recipes to build because it, it uses all of them, and that's a great service. I'm not talking about licensing and other stuff. Um, uh, it's true for Ubuntu, and uh, this, uh, does it uh, the same for Debian. And who does it for containers? Do we know of a project that verify containers? Um, are we sure we have all the sources? And in most cases, the answer is no. Uh, we have uh, a way to, we usually accept containers which download stuff from uh, website tarballs and just extract them. That's not necessarily a good way for reproduction. Uh, you might say, yes, uh, we'll just sign containers. Uh, we, ha we have a great uh, framework for cost sign, which is a great solution to verify the origin. But it doesn't help uh, get typo squatting. All of the container, containers and hand charts I saw you earlier could be signed, and then you have the same choice between signed containers. The emails you or, or keys used to sign could be uh, easily faked. Uh, there's one-time emails and so on. Uh, it's easier to take over someone's GitHub account and then sign in his behalf. Okay, so every mechanism we need to think, would it, what would happen as part of the supply chain? Uh, and at the end, it just verified the origin. It doesn't mean the container is safe. Um, there was, uh, um, earlier this week, there, was, uh, there were a few hackers injected malware into an extension done for Magento. Um, uh, they injected into the proprietary extensions, not to the open source, because they know they were signed and shipped automatically to all the clients. And we're talking about over 200,000 downloads. So signature is great to make sure it's come from a verified source, but it doesn't mean the source is actually uh, could be trustworthy. And when it's a supply supplier, welcome to supply chain. Um, if we're talking about solutions, and I'll do it uh, quite fast, 
we need to talk about container creation best practices. Uh, we need to get the code from verified sources. Uh, we want to, be, to prefer Git uh, for accountability and transparency. Uh, that's better than writing uh, checksums which you can't verify or verify from a weird website. Uh, we want to go that in a different level to also do it for the software. Um, and we want access to Docker files, which is not always available. And I think that is one of the questions we want people to ask. If we're talking about uh, uh, secure and container creation, uh, that's where Kicks keep infrastructure uh, as code secure. Uh, co project is one of the ways, at least one of the ways I'm interested in doing that. Uh, it's an OPA-based rule. Uh, sorry, it's OPA-based uh, scanner that go over your Docker files, health charts, and whatever infrastructure code formats you have. Um, it applies some of the checks with uh, uh, Salsa. Uh, it's available as complete open source on GitHub. Uh, although it's funded by a commercial company, the project is completely uh, open source and free. Uh, example for these kind of scans, uh, would you want to block Docker files which download or extract a tarball uh, as a bad practice? you can have a rule against it. Uh, we're in the process of writing something like that. And we try to balance between too wide and too narrow for that rule because in some cases it might be acceptable. Uh, you want to check your base images. Uh, are they okay? Are they verified? Are the source trusted? Were they scanned and so on? And that's something uh, we're in the process uh, to, to achieve. Um, Kix is supporting a lot of platforms uh, beside uh, Docker and Docker files um, and help charts. We try to support everything uh, cloud native. Uh, released from this week, introduced Crossplane, Pulumi, uh, um, the YAML version, serverless, and K native. Uh, and it's already adopted by GitLab. So you know it's, it's actually working and working quite well. Uh, I leave this for uh, key takeaways. Uh, they're both containers and infrastructure as code is called infra, but it's actually still software. With software, we have the same problem with regular software packages. Biggest one of them, at least to date, is supply chain. And we have to verify things uh, in our supply chain because we don't want to take things from strangers. Um, and that's the logo for our supply chain team. Uh, just a quick example for typo squatting. All of you probably know Salsa. Uh, everyone call it Salsa. But if you go to the website salsa.dev, you'll get this. OK? This is actually salsa.dev. But if you go to GitHub and you go github.com slash salsa, you get this. Because the project is also, it's actually salsa without the A. And that's a great example for typo spotting inside our own trying efforts to secure it. OK? Thank you very much. I'm available for questions both here or our side according to our time limits. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, guys. Oh, yeah. What would be your number one? Could you repeat it for the mic? Of course. So what would be your number one recommendation for those of us walking out of the room terrified <laughs> what we should do immediately? Um, while being terrified, it's still a, a larger problem for all of us. OK, so you're in good hands uh, out of uh, no better alternative. Uh, I would start checking first the two things that worry me are first checking the base images. Uh, because their effect is the biggest. If someone tried to uh, take over the account of one of the distributions, uh, base images, would it be Alpine, Debian, Canonical, whatever? Um, I think the whole ecosystem is in a very bad place. So these, I want to make sure they are, are verified. Uh, the second, that container scanners at date uh, check only part of the, of the packages. Uh, and started part of the information, we need to check them more thoroughly, uh, both checking the diffs um, and checking what's been added. Okay? So even if you don't use, if you use a few levels of base images, 
Make sure you know what's the content. You make sure you have access to the Docker files. You can reproduce it. And then I think the, the uh, level of uh, worriness could be lower. Gladly. Further questions? Thank you very much, guys.